Welcome to Keeping the Good Stuff in, Confidential Information Firewalling with the CRM 114 Spam Filter and Text Classifier. Uh, the speaker today is William Hirazanis. Right? Close. 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 Or, there is Unis, sorry. My apologies. Um, he's a Senior Principal Research Scientist and Team Lead at Mitsubishi Electric Research Laboratories in Cambridge. Check, check. Okay. Good. And I, again, I apologize for being a bit late. Uh, I was poorly informed. <laughs> am I on screen? Yes, I am. Okay. So, here's what I am. What I do is basically everything. Uh, the interesting point here is that everything includes disobeying orders. I wanted to do a spam filter about 1998, 99. I went to my boss and I said, Dick, spam's gonna be a big problem. I wanna work on it. He says, Bill, spam will never be a problem. Go do something useful. So I got him to sign off on a do it on your own time and it's yours. And that's where we got here. Uh, what's the problem we're trying to solve here? It's a very narrow slice of internet security. And that problem is that people are stupid. And the way they are stupid that we're going to try and solve, it's not general stupidity, but the general problem is that people email things they shouldn't email. Not just things they know will be embarrassing, but proprietary information to the wrong person. They get the wrong address wrong. They don't remember what's proprietary or not. It's on the line. They don't know it's not an announced product yet. And then they type in an address they think is right and they hit tab autocomplete return send. Boom. Off the email goes. And you've just sunk yourself. Now the slice of the problem we're trying to solve does not include intent. We can't do anything about whistleblowers. Industrial espionage, personal vendettas, people going postal, trying to just you know, pretend to be Atlas, get into the temple and push out the pillars. No, we can't do that, not with this, not yet. So remember, intent to move information outside the security perimeter is something, we can't, is something we're not addressing. We're addressing stupidity, not intent. Now, what can stupidity cost you? It turns out quite a lot. Uh, if you blow IP, you lose the right to patent everywhere except the United States immediately. If you don't notice it for a year, which happens, then you lose it in the, everywhere in the world. Uh, if you lose, say, customer lists, private PO pricing, uh, you get financial ruin. If you blow an NDA, even though you blew it accidentally, you're in for a civil lawsuit which can be very costly. And if you blow ITAR, that's an international tariff on uh, munitions, um, and munitions can be a lot of different things, uh, you get to spend some quality time out in, uh, in Alcatraz. For, fix version one, you train your employees better. That doesn't work because there is no cure for stupid. Oh, sorry. Two, email is dangerous, turn it off. And there are some organizations that go to this extreme. They air gap their network. I know people who work in places like that. Lawrence Livermore, for example, has the red net and the blue net. Red net is internet connected, blue net is air gapped. And it's a gold standard. You can't accidentally mail the, their classified information out onto the internet. Now, by the way here, some of you are probably military or, or ex-military. The, when I use the word classified, I'm using it in the AI sense, the artificial intelligence sense, which means a process that makes a decision. It does not mean, usually when I say it, uh, that determination that a document should not be seen by the public in general. And when I say unclassified, it means something that I haven't made a determination yet. It doesn't mean what the military means, which is a document that we can show the world. Here's fix version three, Pre require second person review. And I know an organization that does this. Literally, if the people I work with in a certain facility in Japan want to send me an email, they have to get their boss to agree that it's okay to send. And this is a tremendous drain of uh, management time and you know, it impedes things. But 
works. Fix version four. Try an expert system. Have a human expert look for the tells, the telltales, the words, the phrases, uh, the little logo in the corner that says something is confidential or something isn't. And they write some regexes to look for those telltales. And we tried that. And we had human domain experts who knew what was confidential in a particular organization and knew what wasn't. Uh, they ended up with 170 regex rules. It failed to detect on 11% of the confidential emails, and it only false alarmed on 4%, <laughs> which is very good though, but it means that your leakage rate is huge. One chance in 10 that you, send, you make a mistake, it's gonna be a spill, and you're gonna send out something you really didn't wanna send out to someone who shouldn't see it. So they said, well, let's try some machine learning. It's a well-known field, it's predictable, everyone understands it. You're supposed to laugh. But in fact, it does work. Uh, most of you are probably using Bayesian or Markovian spam filters. Even if you don't know you're using it, you are. Your e or your ISP is. Or Gmail is, or Hotmail is, or Yahoo is. Um, so we're gonna take a spam filter. And we're gonna repurpose it. We're gonna tell it that the confidential stuff is spam. The non-confidential stuff is non-spam. Go, go ahead, train yourself. And now whenever you raise an alarm and try to throw something away into the spam bucket, no, send it back to the user and say, hey, take another look at this. We think it's confidential. And we're gonna test this thing and see if it works. This is a research project now at this point, in the slide presentation at least. Sorry. Uh, the spam filter we're gonna use is CRM114. Uh, it's GPL that's open source, and the reason I chose it is because I know the code really well, because I wrote it, or most of it at least. Now we're going to use a thing called tenfold validation. Uh, raise your hand here if you know what tenfold validation is. Okay, I'm going to talk about that then. And the big issue that we didn't expect, why does it have that logo on the bottom? Get rid of that. No, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> Um, is to find enough training information. That's the issue. We didn't expect that to be a problem. It turns out it is, and there's good reasons why it is. Now, the business unit, of course, comes in at this point and says, okay, we, we can give you numbers. Here is your goal to make it something that is product worthy. Uh, recall needs to be better than 99%. Precision must be greater than 90%. Well, what the heck is recall and precision? And these are measures from information retrieval. Raise your hand if you know what we call precision are. Okay, I'm gonna talk about that too, good thing. Okay, information retrieval is the art of finding all the interesting stuff in an ocean of drivel. This may look familiar. Information retrieval is not quite this. Sometimes it feels that way, but it's not that. Okay, recall is the fraction of things you were looking for that you actually found. Precision is the fraction of what you found that were things you were looking for. And here's a way to remember that. You got eight chickens and four ducks. You work at a farm. New city kid comes in. You sell, tell them to bring you the ducks. And the city kid comes back with three ducks and two chickens. Now the recall on the city kid is you got three ducks out of four. You got three quarters of what you were looking for. He has 75% recall. You only got... Uh, three ducks out of five total items though. You had a, a lot of pollution in, the, in, in your return data. So you only have 60% precision. So these two things are coupled. They're independent but coupled. You can, crank them, you can crank your threshold in one way or the other and get better precision or better recall. But uh, together you're basically riding along a curve called the AUC curve. We don't need to worry about that right now. But in general, better precision and better recall means a better classifier in the AI term not the, the military term. Now, NIST, part of the government, actually does some very good studies on this. Amazingly, they're part of the government. They do good work. Uh, they run a conference over you know, called TREK. The goal of TREK is to do text retrieval. And what they're trying to do is to come up with really good algorithms to do difficult information retrieval tasks, finding needles and haystacks. And some of their test sets are very hard. And the best systems on those hard data sets get maybe 50% of all of them that's considered a very good result. Remember, 
call decision, 99% recall means that less than 1% of your confidential information leaks on any given mistake. Mistakes are hopefully rare, so 99% means you've dropped your, your rate of spills to 1% of what it was before. Precision of 99% of means that less than 1% of your alarms are false alarms, less than 10%. And if anybody knows how to get rid of this bar along the bottom, please come up, show me how. Uh, product performance goal, that 170 regex expert system, it had an 89% recall. We need 99% recall. We need a, a factor of 10 improvement. Um, precision, 90% precision. Uh, well, we had 96% precision. So we're actually okay in terms of the false alarm rate with the regex system. <coughs> say, well, wait a minute, Google's already done this. Well, Google solved a different problem. Google is a keyword search system. If you gave Google something like a, a genomics database or a, a, for, a legal forensics database, you, you got 100,000 documents out of BP when you subpoenaed things, all the keywords are all in every document. The word, the, you know, Tony won't like this, probably appears in a third of the corpus. So you can't use keyword search. You can't use cross-referencing because the documents don't form a, what's called one over R squared. They have these central hubs, or they, rather they don't have central hubs. So Google's techniques don't work here. Oh, here's the kicker. Uh, this filter has to work in Japanese. I work for Mitsubishi. And you know, when they think product, they, they think product released in Tokyo, not product released in Cambridge. So it turns out that no one on our team could read or write Japanese. So you know, it didn't matter. <laughs> you know, do, do your machine learning. Now here's the way they actually gave us some test information. There is some ASCII. Capital F, R, O, M, colon, space. That's ASCII. And the rest of the from line in an email may well be in Japanese. It's in a character set, it may be JIS encoded. There are maybe some attachments. And um, those attachments will be converted to Unicode. The plain text is typically in this JIS format, which no one in the world uses except Japan. It's a 16-bit format, and it is not WTAR, and it is not Unicode. It is weird. And then they converted the whole thing to UTF-8. So I got this big block of UTF-8 that I cannot read. And more interestingly, there's no white space in it, because written Japanese doesn't use white space to delimit words. You just got to know. You know Japanese. You've learned what the words look like and where they end. We don't know that, though. Now. CRM114 comes with this whole menu of different classifiers you can use. Um, a lot. We're just going to use a few. I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have a Markov random field. Markov is the second generation of Bayesian. A Bayesian classifier, typically you're looking at single words. A Markov, you look at phrases. A hyperspace, key nearest neighbor, a bit entropy, a support vector machine, and LZ77 string compression. And I'll go into the moving parts in each of these, because it's a little bit interesting to know this, and when you see some of the results, it's worth knowing. What do we have to change? The regex. The regex originally assumes that you're going to be working in a language that uses spaces to space out words, like everybody, except for Japanese. We change that to just going one byte at a time. So we're throwing away that bit of information that says what a word is. And we didn't have to even re recompile because the, the tokenizing regex is uh, it's one of the knobs you can twiddle. Now we'll have to talk about what those classifiers really do. One moment, please. First thing I want to talk about is speech or spatialization. This is the concept of where you take a document, turn it into features, and then Pretend those features are counts in a particular dimension. Like, for example, if you take the white paper and you count the number of places where there's the word A, you find there are 95 A, or excuse me, 85 A's in the white paper. So the, on the A dimension, the position of this paper is at 85. Number of ands is 28. So in the and dimension, we're out 28 steps. And the number of thes in the white paper is 107. So we're up at 107 ticks on the the dimension. And this actually works as a very good way to visualize what a document looks like, because it becomes a single point in the space of all English words. It's a high dimensional space. 